Hey kids, welcome to Art 101. Cohen, hope you like that beginning uh, animation there, kind of playing with some new things and having some fun. In a recent Twitter poll, uh, people from all over the place went on to Twitter, voted on there uh, at uh, my Twitter feed, Mr. Underscore Burger, and uh, voted for Vincent Van Gogh to be the artist that I would cover on this next uh, video. So I'm excited to talk to you about a very misunderstood, a very uh, unorthodox artist who, for all practical accounts, might not have even been a known name in the art world had it not been uh, for some people in his life that really allowed him to be known. So let's jump right Vincent into Van Gogh it. would become the lead expressionist painter of his time. Born in 1853. At a very young age, uh, about the age of 16, he started working... Uh, for art dealers and things like that, but soon knew that he wanted to go into the family business. His father was a minister, and he wanted to follow in his father's footsteps. However, uh, he was not a very uh, good speaker. Uh, I can kind of know what he's talking about. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he wasn't a real good speaker. He wasn't really uh, well polished with his delivery, and kind of the church higher-ups were very hesitant to give him any sort of position. After failing a few examinations, his father, um, who was pretty well known, as was his as grandfather, persuaded the church to give him a shot in a very small, uh, undesirable location in Belgium. In this small community, uh, Vincent soon fell in love with the people and was literally teaching uh, the, the word, so to speak. And in doing so, he gave away all of his clothes. He was living in a barn. Um, he was basically living the life of, basically he was living a life homeless. And uh, it was very much frowned upon. And... Um, for those, among other reasons, the church decided, you're done. At the age of 27, Vincent, after two years of preaching, uh, at the age of 27, he decides that he's going to pursue a path of, of, of an artist. He did receive some formal education, not a lot. Uh, his formal education came from a cousin that was pretty uh, well-known. Uh, as an art, kind of well known as an artist, not hugely popular. He took a few classes at a Brussels Academy. He also sought uh, the advice of other artists that were around him in Paris. Those would include, but not limited, George Seurat and Henry Toulouse. Like Frank. most artists of that time, copying was the, huge. He copied plaster casts and he reproduced those off still lives and things of that sort. But he also made copies of famous paintings, uh, notably uh, Millet and Rubens. He was a huge. Uh, he, he liked the portrait of uh, the portraits of Rubens and the storytelling and landscapes of uh, Millet. We can see a lot of those influences in his first great artwork, the Potato Eaters. The influence of Millet is pretty deep in uh, in this painting, The Potato Eaters. Um, it is known as one of the best examples of his Dutch period work uh, that he made while still living in his home country of Holland. He spent virtually all of the winter of 1884 preparing and planning for this one painting, and, and he does a fantastic job, in my opinion, of really capturing uh, the these uh, hard-working people uh, that he wanted to immortalize in this painting. In this painting, Vincent Van Gogh really wanted to emphasize the, petite, the people, the people that are eating their, their food by lamplight, 
that have uh, gone into the earth and dug these potatoes out of the earth to, to provide their own nourishment, that they have earned a honest living and an honest uh, existence by doing this. And he really wants to, that to be the focus of the painting uh, that he creates. Uh, we also see some qualities of Japanese uh, artwork infused into this as well, which he was very well known for having collected and uh, very much influenced by as an artist. Because of Vincent van Gogh's odd personality, he found himself very much rejected by people around him. Uh, notably, uh, a lot of women uh, found him uh, a little odd and slightly undesirable as a companion. He first started off with these very odd relationships or trying to get into these very odd relationships by proposing to and, and trying to get a relationship going with his landlord's daughter, which wouldn't have been altogether odd, but she was already engaged to be married and she found it a bit um, strange that he was so persistent in pursuing a relationship with her. He then fell in love with a lady by the name of Kay. Her, uh, her husband had died and left her with a very, very young son, an infant. And Vincent loved her very much and wanted to support her, even though he really didn't have the means to do that as he, he didn't have a job either. Um, she was not really that interested in pursuing any sort of relationship with him. And he kind of began a pattern of, what I guess we would classify as stalking, following her around, going around her house, talking to to people that knew her, and just kind of following her around in a very unhealthy way. Vincent's parents found out about this behavior with Kay and was very much disappointed by it. Well, how did his parents know? Well, it so happens that, that Kay and Vincent were first cousins, and Vincent's parents as were um, his aunt and uncle, very much against his persistence in trying to create a relationship with his cousin. His parents were so agitated by this that they kicked him out of the house where he was living and he was kind of on his own again. He, for a short time, was involved with a 39-year-old neighbor uh, and then he went on to other women. The next woman in his life was a known prostitute that he had a very, for all practical purposes, a healthy relationship with. She seemed to take care of him. She had a young child that she was also taking care of, but Vincent was a little bit too immature uh, for her. He spent his money recklessly. He uh, very much well, was very unconcerned with his, 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 um, overall uh, appearance, his uh, cleanliness, and things of that sort, and that kind of didn't go too far in the romance department. Although they, it was a fairly healthy relationship as far as that sort of thing, and Vincent kind of messed things up, there were some other, I mean, it was kind of both ways. Uh, when Vince, Vincent left, he did not leave alone. He did leave with a pretty severe case of gonorrhea. Uh, which you want to be careful of when uh, being involved with the prostitute. His last notable lady friend would be a person that would come, in, another prostitute, that would come between him and future friend Paul Gauguin. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as the story continues. Through all these relationships, Vincent had decided that he was going to uh, live closer to his brother Theo. He, he, uh, his brother Theo was very much a caretaker uh, of him. He provided him with money, uh, he uh, provided him with some artistic guidance, as well as uh, a network of friends, uh, including uh, Camilla Pizarro and his son, um, who would very much be influential to his artistic In development. February of 1888, Vincent left Paris to go to Arles, France, which is in the southern part of the country. There he was going to... Um, keep in contact with his brother through a network of letter writing. There have been several books written on the topics of his sketchbooks and his letter writing, like, for example, this book here, which is very much a, um, uh, 
a book, obviously, on the sketchbooks of Vincent Van Gogh, but there are also others that <coughs> document that document the the letter writings that he uh, and the correspondence between his brother and and him throughout the years. Again, starting around February of 1888, while he was in southern France, he really wanted to start a kind of a fraternal organization where artists could go and work and live and learn from each other. And he wanted to call this the Studio of the South uh, because it was in southern France. He would go on to call this house the Yellow House, the only home that he would ever own, or well, not own, but rent and live independently in. Um, this is the only time that he was ever truly on his own, and he loved the the ability to to have that ownership of his own place. Uh, he did go to his brother and said, I would love to have some other people join me and have this Studio of the South uh, idea go forward. With a little help from his brother, he did get famous artist Paul Gauguin to uh, agree to come become a, a part of that network. The first person, the only person to become a part of that network. So it was Christmas Eve, 1888. And um, he had just gotten news that Theo was going to be engaged to be married. And he was a little bit upset by that because he was very much nurtured by, by Theo. And he thought that it would take away time and money and focus away from him and put it towards someone else. And this new wife and this new relationship. And he was kind of upset by it. Paul Gauguin had presented Vincent with this painting called the painter of sunflowers, in which he depicts Vincent Van Gogh painting these uh, sunflowers in his Paul bedroom. Paul presented this painting as a gift to Vincent, um, and Vincent then it is believed to have said something like, yeah, that's me, but it's me gone mad, or me gone crazy, and he was, uh, Paul was very much insulted by his remarks and uh, this led to a very large argument where Paul would leave the house and go down to the cafe. While he was in the cafe, he's, uh, which was also owned by their landlord, Vincent followed him down there and continued to push the issue, continued to fight the argument. One thing led to another between these two, and Vincent threw a glass uh, of alcohol against the wall behind Paul, narrowly missing him. Paul got very angry by this, left the cafe, went outside. Vincent, not wanting to let the fight die, follows him out into the street. This is where sometimes uh, the, the history of things gets a little bit fuzzy and a little bit muddy. Uh, there are some different accounts and different things that, that were said uh, at this time. According to the police record, Vincent pulled out a straight-edge knife and threatened Paul with that knife um, and then would go back to his uh, go back into the yellow house. Paul would then go down the street to stay with the lady friend prostitute uh, on Christmas Eve. Now back in those days uh, tubes of paint were, were not very common. They did exist. They were around but um, a lot of times Vincent would resort to buying a block of pigment using a straight edge knife to shave that down and then grind that with other chemicals to make his pasty type very thick paint. As he's trying to make this paint he's got a knife in his right hand. He's holding that knife and as he's holding the knife he falls down on the ground and he has a seizure. This seizure was caused by lead poisoning. Uh, when he would go out into the field, he would have paint brushes, and those paint brushes were his number one tools, and there was no way to get oil paint out of a paint brush other than sucking it out. Some people claimed that he had some sort of disease like, like pica, uh, which isn't impossible, but not very believable in my opinion and, and so what he would do uh, is suck the paint out of the brushes in order to preserve the quality of the brushes spitting the paint onto the ground but the paint would still stay in his mouth and, and paint at that time was lead-based paint 
And so he basically gave himself lead poisoning. This lead poisoning causes a corrosion of the brain, a, a decomposition of the brain. Um, that can lead to all kinds of things. If you look at some of his paintings, uh, you'll see halos around the light sources. This is one of the number one symptoms of lead poisoning, um, as is uh, having other symptoms like seizures. Uh, he did not cut off his entire right ear. It wasn't all the way gone. It was just the bottom bit of the lobe that had been removed. It just he just grazed it while having a seizure, and that's what caused uh, his, his ear to be removed. When you look at the entire essence of who Vincent Van Gogh was, it is not believable to think of him purely as this insane nut job artist. That is absolutely ridiculous. He did have his occasional temper tantrums. He was a bit of a manic depressive um, or bipolar in other words. Vincent Van Gogh was a great friend to Paul Gauguin uh, who uh, forgave him for what he for the, for the situation that he had put him in and they forgave each other. He was a very passionate artist uh, who again was suffering from uh, some sort of bipolar disorder. He had some uh, delusions. He did have some issues with, with various uh, elements of consumption. Um, he was a very well-educated man at the same time who was literate in four languages. He loved to read William Shakespeare. He was a, a huge uh, fan of Charles Dickens. He was um, far from this savage drooling mental uh, man that he'd be in a mental institution. He was a very educated, uh, a, a very intelligent man who probably deserves more credit for his intelligence than what he's given. After the seizure took place, it is a fact that he did wrap up his ear in some form of a box, place that with some cotton, and did mail that to the prostitute that that Paul decided to visit on Christmas Eve. I believe that that was a gesture of, uh, you know, this is your fault, kind of a one last personal jab at her, as opposed to something of a, of a crazy person or the acts of a, of a, of a lunatic. Although it, it, there is some lunacy to his actions, I don't think that they were... Um, necessarily intended to be some sort of a charm bracelet gift, but more of a jab of, this is your fault. Because there was really no explanation to why he had these seizures, why, he, why this was happening, they didn't understand lead poisoning, they didn't understand um, what was happening in his brain and, and those sorts of things with, with uh, what the difference between mental disorders and, and things like that were. Um, he placed himself in a mental institution. The hospital that he attended did characterize his condition as acute mania with delusions. While he was in and out of hospitals, he did have multiple uh, seizures. He was having, uh, the police were on constant surveillance uh, of his property because they didn't understand all of these mental issues. Uh, they didn't understand seizures. They didn't understand where any of this was coming from or why it happened, and they just thought, oh, he's insane, he's crazy. Now I'll tell you what, you'd call me insane my whole life because of things that I can't control, eventually I'm going to believe it, and that's exactly what happened with Vince Van Gogh. He eventually came to the, the beliefs of other people. Vincent placed himself into an asylum uh, after having multiple bouts of paranoid delusions, and uh, his idea of this art colony were completely gone. At the mental institution, he did create one of his most recognized artworks from his memory, which is Starry Night. He was not allowed to go out at night. He loved the, the cool air. And so he painted Starry Night. And again, uh, if you notice the, the notable moon and the halos around the stars, this is one of the number one symptoms of someone with lead poisoning. 
these swirls would also become a major part of other works, including his self-portrait from 1889. This particular self-portrait would be the last one that he created out of uh, some 35 painted self-portraits. This would be the last one that he would create. For a brief time in May, he did leave the, the asylum to go visit Theo and his new wife, Joanna, in Paris. And they had just had a, new, uh, a newborn son who they named after Vincent, naming him uh, Vincent William. All the people around Vincent were moving on. And uh, he, he really had a hard time dealing with that. Um, one of those... Uh, in one of the last sessions uh, that he had with Dr. Gachet, the, the, uh, the doctor that he was working with in the, uh, in the institution, um, 10 days before he had died, he complained of being too calm. The last 70 days of his life, he created 70 artworks, although the last three he spent in a coma. That means for the last, over the last two months of his life, he painted a painting every day, start to finish. Uh, he was working at a huge pace. He was making lots and lots of work and doing really, really great things. It is believed that one of his last paintings, if not perhaps his last one, was Wheat Field with Crows. Vincent uh, was out there uh, on location painting this particular work. He had uh, in his possession a loaded revolver. He was allowed to go out while painting and shoot crows which was a supplemental income to the asylum. Vincent uh, got very depressed for some reason, and he ended up shooting himself, fainted, woke up in a pool of blood. Waking up very sad and depressed, he was unable to find the gun and ended up deciding to just go ahead and walk home after sitting there for some time. He ended time. up going in, back into the hospital, climbing into his bed where a nurse had discovered him after finding blood all over the halls and the door. Theo was notified and rushed to his bedside two days later. Theo would arrive finding Vincent propped up in his bed, smoking his pipe. Uh, he, very much, he had a septic fever, which would end up resulting in him falling into a coma. The last words that Vincent spoke before falling into that coma were, saying to his brother, I wish it were all over now. He died two days later. Now, if that was the end of the story with Vincent Van Gogh, all of this would be forgot. We wouldn't know anything about this guy. He would just be another uh, crazy guy who got locked up in a mental institution, who was completely misunderstood and committed suicide and forgotten. His, his paintings would all be thrown in, in a landfill and they'd be garbage. Um, but what happened after his life is really what keeps the idea of Vincent Van Gogh alive. Vincent Van Gogh only painted for 10 years, but of those 10 years, he created over 2,000 artworks. That is equivalent to having had painted at least one artwork for every one and a half days that he was uh, creating artwork, which is an incredible pace for the artworks that he was creating. Uh, and, and a lot of these works weren't even finished things. They were, they were sketches, they were drawings, they were plans. He was coming up with the plan, executing the plan, creating a finished product, all in within a, a day or two. After the death of Vincent Van Gogh, Theo literally, uh, physically and mentally collapsed. He basically died, they say, of a broken heart. Vincent and Theo were buried next to each other. Theo's wife, Joanna, ended up taking all of the artwork and, uh, and, and saving it. And soon, um, because of her, her, her need to sell some artwork and make a little bit of money to support her son, uh, she made a little bit of money, and she's the one that ends up making Vincent Van Gogh's name popular. She sells a few paintings here and there just to collect a little bit of money, saving the favorites for herself. And there were some that she, wouldn't, she kept her entire life. A lot of the artworks that, um, that she sold off, she sold off to people in the United States because people in Europe hated them. So that's why the United States has such a great Vincent Van Gogh collection at its disposal. You go to, to uh, Chicago Art Institute, they've got a fantastic collection of his work. 
as well as other impressionistic work, because people in Europe, and in Paris in particular, hated these. So uh, the ones that she hung on to would end up becoming the, the cornerstone of the artwork in the Vincent van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. It is because of Joanna's work that Vincent's artwork would go on to have millions of admirers and millions of followers and millions of, of kids and, and his name becoming synonymous with art. Um, good or bad, I think it's one of those things that, that people sometimes uh, lose a little bit of grasp on. Vincent van Gogh leaves us with some great pieces of advice. And this is one of my favorite things. You know, Vincent van Gogh, he wrote lots of things down. And one of the things that he wrote down is advice to young people on how to become a great artist. He says, go to the art museum as often as you can. It is a good thing to know the old painters, uh, which is a fantastic advice. And he also went on to say that he believed that uh, artwork and being a great artist had nothing to do with anything you were born with. He said that this is... This is a, a passion, and it is a skill that is developed out of effort. First, by observation, and secondly, by strenuous work and research. Hey, you know what? I, I love going down the path of looking at Vincent Van Gogh, one of my absolute favorites. Hope you guys liked it, too. Please, make sure you follow my YouTube channel. Follow me on Twitter, follow me on wherever social media uh, outlet you, you prefer. Uh, let me know if there are other artists or other things that you'd like me to cover. I always like to get out there and talk a little bit about art and artists. And hopefully this has been a, a little bit of an eye-opening glimpse to Vincent Van Gogh, although this is just the, the absolute surface. Of, of where he's at. There is so much more. Again, there are thousands of paintings that he created. Dig deeper, find other things, and hey, you know, get in there and, and enjoy these art museums as well. Hey, thanks a lot for tuning in. Hey, but what do I know? I color for them, right? Hey.